Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we're unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Maddie Acey. I will be your host for this webinar. Today, we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Taking Your Genealogy Mobile. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star Blog and Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy, this is James Tanner. We're here again at the BYU Family History Library uh, for doing a presentation today on taking your genealogy mobile. Uh, remind those who are listening that these, uh, all of these webinars are recorded and ultimately available on the BYU Family History Library website or through the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. We also encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, when we're taking our, talking about taking our genealogy mobile, there's kind of a lot of different aspects to this, but the, the concept here is that uh, the question of whether or not you're still a horse and buggy genealogist. Uh, I just kind of thought it was a little bit of contrast there between that very expensive car and uh, uh, this uh, horse and buggy. But uh, the idea here is that uh, there's that most of what's going on today in genealogy is moving towards digitizing records, uh, making things available through online searches. Um, in fact, most of the archives and, cattle and uh, libraries throughout the country and actually throughout the world uh, have an online catalog or have access of some kind to uh, online resources. And uh, more and more, most of those resources are becoming mobile. Some of the dis some of the um, statistics that we that I've looked at recently uh, indicate, for example, that they expect that by uh, in another two years, by 2017, 18, uh, at the latest by 2070, about 70 percent of the entire world will have access to smartphones. So uh, basically what we're talking about is, is uh, they've passed many billions already into two and a half, something like that, two and a half billion, three billion people with, with smartphones. And what that actually means is that virtually everyone, uh, even the people that we consider to be third world, backward, whatever countries, what they've decided to do in those countries is uh, forego the, uh, the, the, the traditional a telephone and uh, and data connections that we've been built our country on with wires strung between houses and wires everywhere and under the streets and and everywhere and simply go straight to mobile so they uh, they've simply avoided the the whole idea of having to put up uh, wires all over their countries um, so there's lots of countries now that have adopted that completely uh, and uh, we have a tendency to think of people being backward, and, and it now uh, most of those people now have access to uh, to some sort of computer service. They have to be really out there in the tribes and, and the different places in Africa and other places that still have, have not gotten uh, internet service. Um, so the question here is: is are we are we simply clinging to the uh, tradition? Traditional methodologies that we've had for uh, you know last hundred years as genealogists, uh, which by the way are still very currently being taught in most of the conferences. Uh, one thing uh, uh, lately, I haven't been to that many conferences because of my time commitments at BYU and uh, here in Provo. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I do go through the the offerings, the classes that are offered and whatever, and I see that. Uh, uh, by and large, there's still a lot of really traditional paper-based genealogy being taught out there. And so the question is, uh, which direction are we going and, and uh, 
what are we going to be able, how are we going to achieve that? Um, and, and I need to make sure that you understand that taking your genealogy mobile is more than smartphones because there's uh, this concept that uh, we need to be someplace to do genealogy and that that is has completely changed. Um, I can remember years ago, this is uh, uh, when I was practicing law in, in Phoenix, Arizona. One of the things that happened in Phoenix periodically and happens uh, still from time to time is we get uh, uh, the rains and that's really unusual. It does rain there occasionally and uh, if it rains too much then the rivers run. Uh, normally in a place where you live you have a river that runs uh, you call that a river. In, in Arizona, if it's a dry bed with sand at the bottom, that's the river. But if it rains and there's water in it, then that's a flood. So the Salt River, which runs through Phoenix, Arizona, floods flooded at that time. And it cut the town in half. At the time, there were like three, three usable bridges, east and west, across Phoenix. And I had to go across the bridges to get to work back and forth. And I can remember seeing somebody with one of these giant, oh, 10 to 12 inch, maybe five pound phones that they had a huge thing in their back, in the trunk of their car that was the broadcaster, that they were on there looking. And I was sitting there in, in traffic for two and three and four hours at a time thinking, if I had a mobile phone, I could be making money. I could be sitting here working. Well, I, that dream has been more than fulfilled. I literally can carry computers around with me uh, all day long, every day, and I've never more than a than a reaching in my pocket and pulling out my my phone from uh, connecting to the internet. Uh, so the question is, does that a benefit or is that a detriment? Is that something that we're interested in? Is that something we're not interested in? Are we resisting the transfer over to mobile devices, or are we uh, embracing the technology and leveraging the technology to do more uh, and more with with the time that we have to do genealogy and some of the other things that we would like to do. Um, one of the one of the questions that I always got uh, that I always got when when cell phones became very very common was people would say well I don't want a cell phone because it's too intrusive I just it, it just bothers me all the time and I said well yeah, and that's why they have an on and off button. All you do is turn the thing off and it doesn't bother you at all. And uh, so people have learned that from me that I just, uh, for example, my grandson the other day was trying to call me on the phone and I looked at it after a while and he'd called me five times. And I, uh, and I talked to him and I said, well, look, let me tell you something. Send me an email message if you want to talk to me. That's where I'll pick it up. I said, I don't answer my phone. So, you know, you, you you can have control over this over this technology if you understand how it works and what what you need to do to get to it. So let's learn how to take our genealogy mobile, meaning uh, moving beyond being uh, paper based, moving beyond being location based, and moving into uh, the time when you're go into a situation, an organization, and methodology where you're going to be able to. Uh, make use of the of the vast resources that are pouring into the world, uh, into the world of uh, digitalization and online services. And this is important because uh, we have this idea of mobile being I'm going to have my computer when I go travel. In other words, uh, the laptop syndrome, where you're picking up your computer and and checking your way through the the security line at the airport and opening your bag and putting out your computer and things. No, the answer here is that mobile means mobile in the sense that you're able to work where you are even if you stay in the same place. Uh, it's not necessarily an idea of movement, it's in a society of being connected without having to go to a certain location, sit in front of a, of a computer or sit in a certain desk or location that you, to do with the work that you're doing, that you can work from wherever you happen to want to be at the time. And uh, if, if you enjoy comfortable, if it's comfortable and you've got a, 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 a good chair and a, a good uh, environment, uh, most people that I go in and look at their homes as I visit and, and uh, help people with their genealogy, I have an opportunity to go into a lot of homes 
And I see these uh, people with these computer desks that are just a table and uh, they're not the right height and they're not comfortable and they're stuck in a corner and they've got nothing to look at while they're doing their computer. And uh, it, it's just miserable. So if you make yourself miserable with a computer, then you will be miserable. But if you take the time to break away from that misery and, the, and making it a chore and a duty, uh, it, it, it's just like anything else. I mean, I can see people sitting on the beach and reading a book. Well, I can sit on the beach, beach and do my, my genealogy if I feel like doing it. Uh, actually, I'd prefer not to. It's pretty warm and sunny and windy and sandy. I'd rather be someplace else, but you know, that's, that's just what you can choose. Okay, so let's understand this because the whole concept here is that we have created uh, this extension of ourselves that we're calling the cloud, and that's sort of a jargon term uh, for the internet. But basically what it means is we have, uh, we've created programs and storage devices that exist out there that we can access either through wire or through what we now call Wi-Fi or uh, Bluetooth or other types of very limited connection type uh, methods where we can literally be in any room in our house and connect to the computer without having to wire or plug in or being even connected. Uh, I can walk into the library, pull out my phone and be online and check my email and do whatever else I want to do. I can walk into a supermarket and do the same thing. I can be walking around uh, following uh, uh, my uh, uh, wife while she's doing shopping in the supermarket and be checking my email and talking to people on the phone. Uh, obviously, there's some limitations there and there's some annoyance on the, on the part of people who, who do that kind of thing in public. So, uh, But the, the answer is that, that that's what the cloud enables us to do. It enables us to be connected uh, literally from any place that we want to as long as we have a device that, that takes advantage of those connections to that, to that uh, set of internet. So what is the internet cloud? It's literally, it is, a, it is a millions and millions, it's a, a base of millions and millions of computers that are out there handling the, the connections and the transactions and the uh, information that you want uh, from that connection to the to the internet or to the cloud. So when I do that, I may be connecting to uh, hundreds of computers around the world as I uh, as I even check my email, for example. So <clears throat> from a genealogical standpoint, uh, the cloud is made up of these millions of <clears throat> computers linked together. <clears throat> excuse me, worldwide, and it's usually called the internet or the web. Uh, those two terms have become almost synonymous. Uh, we used to inter <clears throat> try to tell people the internet is the physical connection and the web is all the software, but now there's really not much of a distinction between the, the devices and the software. So we that kind of thing has sort of disappeared also. And uh, <clears throat> the term is usually refers to online memory or file storage websites. So when we're utilizing the cloud, we're moving information into someone else's computer where it is stored either semi-permanently or temporarily, and then we're either moving it some and you're sort of at the at the mercy of the electrons there. You, whether you or not you have control over it is uh, somebody else's is usually up to somebody else besides yourself. Uh, that's kind of unsettling for most people. And it's particularly unsettling if you're involved with um, with genealogy because that's a very conservative and it creates a, a conservative uh, avocation and it and it uh, creates a lot of information. And you don't want to lose that information, but we'll talk about that too. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're talking about out there is we have information. Now, for example, we have programs like FamilySearch.org. Now FamilySearch is a, uh, has a website that contains millions and millions of records, uh, a catalog, uh, a huge encyclopedia called the Wiki and other things. And all of those are accessible, usable from any device. 
So anything I have, from a smartphone to a tablet to a laptop to a desktop computer, uh, anything that I can connect to the internet will allow me to connect to and use that information that is on those um, uh, on that website. Uh, the same thing with a big website like Ancestry or MyHeritage or Find My Past or any of the other big websites that we have for genealogy out there. Uh, they are in the cloud in a sense that they are accessible from anyone who has a computer. Okay, so let's <clears throat> let's go here to uh, the the idea here <clears throat> that files are stored out there in the cloud. Now, this is <clears throat> sometimes a, a difficult concept for people to understand. When you run a program, for example, if I create a, a document in a word processing program, or I open my genealogy database programs, Roots Magic or Ancestral Quest or Family Tree Builder or something like that, and I store my information in that, I create a file. I create <clears throat> a place where using that program, I can go back and retrieve that information uh, at a later date. I can, even, I can even transfer that information to other people. I can send that file as if that file had real corporal existence. It's just like uh, we call that virtual reality. And the file exists in, uh, in its form and can be transmitted. It can be stored. It can be copied. It can be uh, all sorts of things with that. And the places where we store those files um, are usually uh, on our computer on a hard drive. But the alternative is that we can use someone else's hard drive, someone else's computer, someplace out there in the world. And we don't really care where it is as long as we have access to it and, and have some degree of security that when we go back, it's still going to be there. And if we want it tomorrow, it'll be there and so forth. Uh, we have a number of companies out there on, online that do nothing more than provide you with access, provide you with a place to store your programs. Uh, some of these cost money, and some of them are free. Uh, free in the sense that it costs you the overhead of having a computer, smartphone, or a tablet, and uh, an internet connection. Um, so free is not really free in that sense, but free in the sense that there is no additional charge for becoming involved with these companies. The ones that I have here on, on the screen are like Dropbox, Microsoft One's Drive, uh, Google Drive, Apple iCloud. There are many, many more. This is not by any means exhaustive. There are literally thousands of these websites out there. And each of them have varying uh, degrees of, uh, of what they charge or what they don't charge or how much, how much storage you can put on them for free, how much you have to, once you hit that level, do you have to pay more and things like that. And um, the idea is here that I can move files back and forth through these programs and also move them over to other people. Now, when this first occurred to us, uh, one of the things that was difficult uh, for, um, for people outside of a commercial networking type situation was that if I wanted to talk between my computer sitting in front of me, my laptop or my desktop computer or whatever, and my wife's computer, uh, that could be in the same or a different room, I had to network. I had to have some wire connection between the two, or I had to have some way to, to, to move the data between those two computers. Once we became connected to the internet, it didn't take us very long with program like Dropbox, for example, to figure out that we no longer had to have our computer, computers wired together. In fact, they didn't even have to be in the same room, the same city, or the same state. All we had to do was move the file into Dropbox and invite the other person to look at it. And when the other person looked at it, they had the file. Uh, when this finally occurred to us, this is quite a few years ago, but when it finally occurred to us, we realized that we could move files between the two of us sitting there side by side. We didn't have to go through any kind of of uh, difficult connection issues or setting up a network or getting involved with anything. All we had to do was we already had the network. We had the internet. And so 
when I send a, a file to my wife, who is sitting three feet away from me, I can simply drop it in Dropbox, and she picks it up two seconds later and has the file. Uh, so this whole process, this concept of being able to move the information from one point to another virtually instantaneously and any place in the world it creates a, a different way of doing the work than we've been used to. Okay, so now we're going to take that one step further. We're going to take what you have on the paper. So you have a piece of paper and it has a uh, it has information on it. In this case, it could be a pedigree re a pedigree file. Uh, it could be a family group record. It could be a story, a history. It could be a transcription of a will. It could be a picture of a will from a uh, from an do original document. Uh, could be anything. And what we do with that document is we have that on the paper. So that document's there on on a piece of paper, and we take that and we scan it or we take a photograph of it with a digital camera and it goes to uh, through that scanning process turns that into what's now a digital file a file that can be transmitted or used by the computer and then that all of a sudden appears in a, a program on our computer so we can then take that particular program and anyone else who's using the same program and they have access to that file and the question here is do we have to give them access can anybody see it how secure is it all this kind of stuff well the answer is that um, it depends it depends on on what you want to do if you want to share that file with someone you can if you want to make it locked away so that no one can see it then you can do that also but I think the essence here of genealogy in the way that this whole thing is evolving is that we are sharing this information and collaborating with this information with people that we don't necessarily, would never have necessarily talked to in, before in our lifetimes. So we're extending this concept of, of using the data to include contacting, communicating with essentially the whole world. Uh, and that it changes the way that we that we do this work. So once that file is has been scanned and turned into a or, or digitized with a camera uh, and made a, a digital file, then that piece of paper that that was in existence with the document on it is no longer part of the process because from then on I can use that information that file. Uh, that digital file as if it were the same as that piece of paper. But the difference is, is that I can then send that by Dropbox to anyone else's device, any place in the world that I want to. So, uh, and if you think of that in terms of, of moving paper, then you begin to understand that uh, there's a long difference between putting a typing out a sheet of paper, putting it in an envelope, putting a stamp on it, sticking it in a mailbox, putting it in, uh, letting the, somebody pick that up and deliver it to someplace else physically around the world, having them open it up and look at that piece of paper and then throw it in the garbage, that uh, you can avoid by having all of this uh, technology. And that is the same thing with, uh, with any of your genealogy files. You're going to be doing the same thing going to create them into digital format so that they can be then uploaded and viewed and used by anyone uh, or any any place that you would like to invite someone to, to do so. And the answer to that is you can be free of paper. Now, technically people say to me, oh yeah, but I love books or oh yeah, but I, I always still have paper. I can't, I can't stand reading on a computer and on and on and on. We hear all that kind of stuff. In fact, I had some very uh, interesting comments to make about that recently when I was writing it, uh, in my blog, and it turned into a rather long uh, and very interesting discussion online about uh, the fact that, uh, uh, that there was still some significant resistance out there to, to getting away from paper completely. But the answer is, uh, you, this is inevitable. The, 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 the fact that, that we are moving that direction in genealogy is not 
something that you can control or something that you are uh, that you have input into. You're not uh, your opinion about whether you should have uh, preserve a paper copy of things or not is totally immaterial. Eventually, the those who uh, who end up running your world uh, in the next 20 years or so uh, will have will have wondered why in the world you ever thought that was even necessary to worry about. Um, we're already to that. I already have uh, uh, grandchildren, as they mentioned in the introduction of this, uh, who, who simply do not have a concept of putting things down on a piece of paper. Uh, they turn in their homework online. They write everything online. They type everything out that they're talking about. They just, uh, they very seldom, unless they're drawing or doing something creative, they, they really don't have anything to do with paper. So it's kind of an interesting situation. So uh, whether you like the idea or not is not really an issue. It's whether or not that's going to happen. Maybe paper is security. Maybe you you are are uncomfortable with the idea that that all of your work is being preserved by a little bunch of electronic blips. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing to think about uh, because uh, we do have to worry about our backing up and, and preserving our, our digital data. But the idea of it being some kind, somehow more secure than uh, the electronic uh, reproduction of it is is sort of an illusion. Um, what can happen to paper? Well, ultimately, you'll see what happens when I uh, when we deal with people who who pass away uh, in our community, and uh, uh, we're watching their uh, relatives or uh, heirs, whoever you want to, refer, however you want to refer to them, uh, disposing of their worldly goods uh, after their demise, as we say in the in the legal profession, and uh, the answer is that when you when you die, it do, it goes, and it doesn't matter if it's paper or not. I've watched people dump, uh, and in fact, uh, that is one of the biggest losses that we have in genealogy is the uh, the loss that genealogists who have worked for years in their lives accumulating a vast amount of information, to only to have their children throw it all away because they have no appreciation for the the importance of it. Okay, so what we what what we what we boil down to is this: that genealogy is information, it is communication, it is information data that is stored in a an organized fashion about a specific subject, and as such, it can be put in any form that information can be put in. So the more uh, the 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 easier it is to work with that information, the faster it can be manipulated, accessed, and and searched. Uh, the more uh, the more information that can be developed. So uh, the question is this: If I worked my entire life on paper and began the process, as many of my ancestors did, of creating their genealogy. They all ran into the same end. They all ended about the same place, because uh, meaning the same time depth into the past, because they got too old and could no longer continue to pursue the genealogical. So every year, every time uh, there was a generation of new genealogists that came along, if anybody was interested, they had to go back through the entire process and redo it all over again. Um, even if you, even if for some reason the records were preserved, which they weren't always preserved, uh, I'm aware of, of a significant amount of genealogy, my own family that's been lost over the years. But uh, even if it were uh, preserved, uh, it still required the same amount of work to go back through and understand and begin to understand where you needed to be. The the difference today is that that we now all work on the same pool of information and we don't have to redo it every time. Now we can sort of check online and see where everyone else in the world is um, in what point they're doing their, the, our genealogy. And uh, we're not going to be sliding back every time there's a generational change. From now on, things will continue to progress, um, whether or not we want them to, uh, they will. 
because uh, that's the way that the, uh, the programs and the internet and the cloud and all these things have been designed now. So one important fact is that the genealogy as information can be entirely digitized. So there is no part of the, of the, of the genealogical process that can't be digitized. Now, when we talk about this, we're not saying that these paper records that we've accumulated over the past thousand plus years are going to go away. They'll still be out there. But the way that we, uh, that we access those records, the way that we search them and look through them will change as more and more records become digitized. We've seen that process and we are really uh, kind of at the threshold of the of this digital world. We we tend to think that we're well into the computer, um, uh, as they call it, the second uh, industrial revolution. Uh, we actually passed through the the second industrial revolution, and now we're into a third one called the information revolution. And we're only at the very beginning of that information revolution. We're still in the process of digitizing the existing records and making them available. Once they're digitized and available online and all new records are created uh, electronically as they are now, then, uh, then we begin to break away from that, uh, that original form. And first of all, all of the text, images, documents, and photos, everything that we have can be digitized eventually. And what we're doing is we're taking the information that is essentially locked up in that piece of paper and we're moving that information into a form that can be used online and transmitted and uh, manipulated through these devices that we call computers uh, and in, in all their different forms. So we can take a standard paper pedigree chart, for example, and then we can digitize that, take that information out of that pedigree chart so that it appears in an online program. So here what we have is a paper, ditch, a paper pedigree chart, which uh, someone has taken the time to key into a computer. And then that same information that was on that paper chart now appears in, a, in an online family tree program. So we can go on to FamilySearch.org or Ancestry or MyHeritage or Find My Past or any of the other programs out there, Genie, um, uh, Wikitree, all sorts of programs where we can look at the data that is online and it is a virtual representation, a electronic representation of that paper document that we had previously. So what we then have is we have a whole bunch of programs that have been now transferred from our computers, from the from being loaded onto our machine or put onto our uh, tablet or our smartphone or whatever, and these programs are actually an extension of the internet. So they are tools that we use to store and evaluate and review and look at and and uh, exchange share our uh, genealogy files. So what are these programs? Well, they're the ones I've already mentioned and, and I'm going to go into two. So we have two different kinds of programs here. Dropbox, OneDrive, and Google Drive, and Apple iCloud are, are programs that store data in sort of the abstract. So it doesn't really matter what kind of file you have. So for example, uh, if I were to use a program uh, that we would traditionally think as a desktop program like Roots Magic, for example, uh, or Ancestral Quest, or or uh, Family Tree Builder. A couple of throw out a couple of names. Obviously, there's there's a lot more programs out there. But let's say I have this program, like uh, Family Tree Builder, which comes from My Heritage. It's a free program used for storing your genealogy. Well, the truth of the matter is that I can get a copy of Family Tree Builder on my phone. Uh, that will look at that same information, my heritage information. I can look at my my heritage family tree on a tablet, on my desktop computer, on a computer here in the library, or any place else that I want to, to access that information. Why? Because I can put the file that I've created 
into a program like Dropbox or on Google Drive or OneDrive. And then I have access to that file as if it were sitting on my computer. So now I am not only program independent, but I am device independent. I really am not dependent on one type of computer. Now we can do the same thing with FamilySearch.org, Ancestry, Find My Past, My Heritage. All of these programs are also device independent. They all work right on whatever whatever particular device you happen to have. So they are universal tools in a sense. If I have my family tree on my heritage, I can have my heritage on my smartphone. I can have my heritage on a tablet, on an iPad, on a desktop computer. I can go into a library and use a computer and find and get onto my heritage. Uh, any place where I am, I do not have to have a physical carrying in my pocket flash drive with my file on it. I don't have to uh, uh, depend on having my computer. I don't have to even have my smartphone. I can even borrow one and look at it if I wanted to. Um, so there, you know, these are are things that uh, have made us it completely, in a sense, independent of of being in any one specific location or 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 mode. Uh, of accessing this information that can now be moved uh, from one place to another. And that's why I call this going mobile. You're, you're really mobile. It's not a mobile device. It's a mobile information. The, mobile, the information itself has become mobile. It can move, its, it move in its form through any number of, of locations and devices and varieties of, of transfer. So we can now view the contents of our genealogy files on mobile devices. Okay, well, I don't know that this is such a, a revolutionary thing for people to find out. But I would, but I suggest as I talk to people, um, even younger people, uh, this is not a concept that they are comfortable with yet. Lots of people are just simply not comfortable with the fact that they don't have what their files in their possession in a place like a file folder in a drawer. And so that is, that, that's the difficulty. Uh, you have to start thinking in terms of being completely independent of the, um, of, of the location of where you are, of where the data is or how it's stored. And um, then we talk about security, backup, all these kinds of things. Now, uh, that's, that's a, those are different issues. Uh, the, they're all part of the issue. If I were talking about this with an, uh, an analogy to a city, uh, all of the roads and streets and freeways would be the means of, of, of interchanging information in the city, of moving from one place to another. Uh, but I would still have to have a house. I would still have to lock my car. I would still have to not go to places that were, were dangerous in the city to go to. Uh, I probably would not be flashing money around downtown in a big city, uh, those kinds of things. I would probably make some, uh, you know, be a little bit aware of things that are going on. And that's the same thing with the, the, this online world. Uh, there are places that are dangerous and there are places that of security. And we simply have to learn what those are and learn how to take advantage of them. Um, so the question then comes up, how much of your genealogy can you move to mobile devices? So we have a whole bunch of different size shrinky tablets from big to little. You know, we have the, the uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears sizes for, um, for mobile devices. It depends on what you want to lug around. Okay. The answer to that simple question is all of it. Everything you have can be put online. Uh, this this is uh, the realization that I had that this was uh, a fact uh, actually occurred to me a, a few couple of years ago, and uh, it coincided with the fact that I had grandchildren who were old enough to uh, to assist me in this process uh, for a little bit of uh, you know comfortable remuneration. Uh, 
and hiring my grandchildren, I've been able to get them to come in and, and digitize. Uh, one summer, one of my grandsons digitized 50,000 pages of, of uh, documents for me. Uh, the next summer, another one came in and did 30,000 pages. So we, we, you know, we're getting to the point now where I'm really starting to seriously move it now. I had all of those those uh, files that were digitized, but now what I'm doing is paying the grandchildren to uh, upload them to uh, to the websites. So particularly in this case, I'm using uh, Family Search as memories, and I have one of my grandsons in uh, who is now being paid to upload files to uh, to Family Search memories all day long. So an interesting uh, job. Very boring, by the way. He usually comes in after a few hours and says, I'm going to sleep. I can't stay awake anymore. <laughs> so, and that's the end of it. Um, so what do you need to do to go mobile? What is this whole process involved? Well, what this process involves, first of all, is to use a genealogy program that supports mobile devices. Okay, well, that would seem to be tautological. If you want to go mobile, you use mobile. Uh, the answer is that not all the programs are yet to that degree. Um, as a matter of fact, it seems to have escaped a lot of the uh, genealogical programmers as of yet that, uh, that the world is going mobile with phones. Uh, it would seem to me of, of the utmost priority if I were uh, still running a software development company as I did for a while, that I would be uh, sitting there pounding the table and adamantly insisting that we need to get everything working on all the devices or we're not going to be in business for very long. Uh, but that seems to have escaped a lot of the genealogy people. But there are those who are taking advantage and you uh, should be aware of which companies and which programs uh, are supporting your uh, the movement of your information and the retrieval of it. Secondly, you need to have access to an online storage program. Obviously, uh, Dropbox is one that comes to mind. It was one of the original ones. It was one of the ones that created, uh, that changed the way people actually did their work. And as I've pointed out already, there are a number of other very large ones out there. Uh, some of the companies, uh, like Google, for example, uh, have uh, large storage for free. Uh, they also have some conditions on which on how you can get that storage. So there's all sorts of things that you need to be aware of in this particular area. So basically what you're going to do is make copies of all your files and put them into an online program. So everything you have goes online and then you have access to all of that from any device that you want to use at any time you want to make that access. Now your question of course is, so what if everybody else does too? Do I really want to share my everything I have, my genealogy with everybody else in the world? The answer is, well, yes. The answer to, from my standpoint, of course, is yes, you do. That's exactly because you do not own your genealogy. It's, uh, it's all part of, you're part of a family. The family jointly owns all of that information, as I would say, jointly and severally have the uh, interest in the genealogy and so, uh, you really don't have that kind of a claim. But those of you who think in terms of owning your genealogy, uh, you have a way of doing that online without sharing. Obviously, you can have private programs or put your information into, into uh, code word uh, protected uh, uh, places on the internet. And then the answer is, uh, most simply, uh, is to work with a tablet with a Bluetooth keyboard. Um, one of the big debates that I kind of went through the last six or eight months was whether or not to uh, replace my laptop computer, which was a MacBook Pro, uh, with a different kind of device. Uh, ultimately, after spending many, many months uh, of and analyzing it and, and working with the devices and thinking about what I was doing and what I would give up and what I would not give up, I realized that I could do uh, virtually everything that I needed to from a mobile device on the new iPad Pro from Apple. Uh, I could also have done it on a Microsoft Surface. Both of those uh, devices have the capability of doing um, a lot of work 
a very, very high percentage of the amount of work that you need to do. Now, of course, there are those that say, well, the, the Surface is a real computer and the iPad is runs iOS, which is not a real operating system. Most of that has to do with uh, advertising and uh, which camp you're in, not necessarily uh, the reality of actually doing work and moving information back and forth. I found that uh, uh, there are ways to move move information in both in both camps, uh, working on PCs and working on on Apple products. And also, you have to adjust to the programs that are on the tablet device. Um, uh, there are a whole new set of skills that you might have to learn. Um, working with your fingers on the screen is different than working with a mouse. Uh, if you're used to a trackpad, uh, you're probably closer to working with a with a tablet device than you are if you're dependent on a mouse. If you if you feel like the mouse is the ultimate way of input, uh, then you may have some difficulties there. Um, I've Basically, one of the things that I've discussed over the years is my evolution from uh, from working with a, a keyboard to a mouse, and then from a mouse to a to a uh, touch pad. Uh, right now, uh, I have I spend uh, virtually 100% of my time on with a touch pad, except when I'm working on computers in libraries and other places that don't have one available. Okay. Uh, so now we have the physical devices that will let us be mobile and work online. Uh, that's that's the key. The key is we can walk around, we can move, we can connect, and we have those devices. And then we have uh, the the software that can do it. So here's my here's an example from my own from my own experience, and that is here's a screenshot of my iPad Pro running Roots Magic. So if any, anybody's worried about being able to uh, operate the program on the on a uh, tablet or a, an, an iPad type environment, there it is. Uh, the program works. Uh, I can operate the program uh, very, very similarly to uh, what I can if I have it on my desktop computer. Uh, are there some some diff uh, things that I can't do? Um, I think there will always be things you can't do, whether or not it's on a desktop computer or on a, a mainframe a supercomputer. There's always going to be something that somebody can think of they can't do. Uh, the idea here is to focus on the things that you can do and then figure out ways to do the other things uh, using either online sources or whatever. Um, now, this was one of my concerns when I went to the point where I am now in almost being device independent. And that is, how did I get the screenshot to, into my presentation? OK, so here's, here's my screenshot of my iPad running uh, Roots Magic. That's actually my file sitting on my computer, on my iPad. So how did I get that into my presentation? Uh, I don't think I pulled out my camera and took a picture of my iPad screen. Uh, I basically created a key, there's a keyboard command and a command for the iPad Pro and for any other computer out there where you can take a screenshot. And there is software that allows you to do that. So then that's what I did. I took a screenshot from my iPad Pro. I used the commands in the iPad Pro that allowed me to take a photograph, a digital photograph or digital image of what was on my screen. I then moved the screenshot image to my Google Drive. So Google Drive is a online drive. So once that image was digitized, it became something that I could move. So I copied it into what was called Google Drive. It's a uh, online free from at least to some level storage. Uh, and I just copied that uh, screenshot. I then opened the Google Drive on my iMac and I downloaded the image and I dragged the image to my presentation. So I, uh, without ever, you know, without doing anything other than using the devices I had at hand, I was able to go through the presentation and put it in the presentation. Now here's the next step of the thing. 
I could have run the presentation program on my iPad and I wouldn't have had to even use my desktop computer to create that pres this presentation. I could have gone through the whole process. So as you're working with your genealogy, you'll find out that yes, you really can put all this information into your devices and move it up online and then have it any place else that you want to get to access to it. I can do exactly the same thing that I just did explained with the presentation and the and the screenshot with my genealogy file. I have a desktop file, I have my pedigree, I have all my information, my sources and my notes and my all that stuff and my media items and my everything. I can take all that, share it to Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever program I happen to be using. Then that can go to my mobile device. So there I am. I have all the information that I had previously looking at it on my on my mobile device. I can go the other way around. I can take the information that I acquire through my mobile device. In fact, smartphone, my iPhone, for example, has a, has a, a very good camera. I can take a picture of a document, uh, assuming I'm not violating somebody's copyright law, and I can then upload that immediately to Dropbox or Google Drive or whichever program I happen to be using. And then when I go back to my desktop, I have that file available uh, without having to of ever having have to touched any paper or made any copies or done anything. Okay. So let's suppose that I uh, I'm sitting here in the library. I go downstairs to the social sciences library. I find a book that has a probate file in it that I needed to know about. Uh, instead of sitting there and copying that out by hand, I simply pull out my phone, take a picture of the page, upload it to Google Drive, and when I get home, I can read it on my device or I can read it on my desktop computer or I can put it into a computer. Now, why would I continue to use a desktop? That's the, the question that comes. Well, there's two things. One is, it's more comfortable to sit when I have a desk and I have places to work and I have some place to work like a table or something. That's just comfort level. But the second part of it is I have 27 inch screen and sometimes I have two thing, two screens set up. And so, you know, it's just, uh, it's a matter of, of convenience of working at a bigger, a different scale. Technically I could do it all on my smartphone. I would go blind and I would never be able to see anything because I can't see the shrinky little shrinky stuff on my smartphone. Let's just be real practical when you're an old guy. Uh, but anyway, uh, but I can do it. it. It is possible. It's just a lot more comfortable when you're sitting at home. So you can move anything on your computer to another device and then move that to some other device. So we have this fluid kind of, of ability to move information. Uh, so if I'm sitting in uh, the library and I, I put information into a computer, uh, I can go retrieve that with my iPad or my phone or my tablet or on somebody's computer any place else that I want to be. And that makes, uh, it also makes it so that there's much less possibility that that information is going to be lost, a much lower possibility of loss than if it was only in one place at one point at one time. Okay. Let's be serious about this. What are the limitations? What is it that stops us from doing all this? Number one, file size. It takes time to transfer and store and uh, time to transfer files. And we also have some limitations on storage capacity. That's certainly the case online where if you get files, too many files too big. Now, an example, just recently, I uh, began the process of upgrading my computer which is absolutely and was very timely because the old computer I have just died this morning. <laughs> just as I got all the information off of it onto my new computer, it deceased. So we're sitting at home trying to see if I can resurrect the old computer, but it looks like it may be serious. It may be time for its travel to the computer burial ground someplace in the middle of Africa, I think. I don't know where it is, but you know, I'm sure that's where they'll, they all go to die. Um, but this 
is one of the problems. What did it take for me to do this? Well, I just backed up one copy of my data and it took six days of copying, 24 hours a day for six days to copy those files. You are got, you've got to understand how much time it's going to take to do these things. Storage capacity is the interest. I'm up to eight terabyte drives. Uh, I would get larger if they sold them. That's just the answer to it. Um, one of the other limitations is your type of file that you use. Uh, the programs must be the same or recognize the files on your devices. So it doesn't help you if you have it in some obscure little program that somebody that you love <clears throat> that's wonderful if nothing nobody can read the file. So um, you just have to be careful that there's more, uh, if they can be shared uh, almost universally. The advantage of working with online programs is that the online programs will, are recognized by any device usually. Uh, there are some limitations, but they're more universal because any, any device that has access to the internet can get those files. And the type of device. This is my question that I rose that I uh, talked about a minute ago. Uh, screen size, keyboard, lack of program. So those are all the kinds of things that are limitations. And last, you need to always need to have a connection to the internet. If you go camping in central Utah, you're out of luck. Uh, there's lots of still places in Utah where you you get the no service sign on any of your devices. So um, there are places to get out of the internet. And the answer about this is that, um, yes, you're going to have to share. And I would suggest that you have fun sharing. That you don't become limited to dealing with um, this all this stuff yourself. And so now we'd like to thank you all for watching this and invite you to uh, subscribe to our BYU YouTube channel and get a notice of all of these new videos that are being uploaded. And also to check the schedule on the BYU Family History Library uh, webpage. Uh, it's part of byu.edu. And if you go to the BYU Family History Library webpage, we have a schedule of all the upcoming webinars. Thank you for watching.